So I recently found this really slick proof of the irrationality of the square root of two on the Math Overflow website. So you can find it, it's this post number 32011 if you wanna check out this original post. And it uses this thing called Bezu's Lemma, which is a classic result from elementary number theory. And so, well, let's first look at Bezu's Lemma and then we'll look at this really nice proof. So it says that for all natural numbers A and B, well, actually it says this for all non-zero integers A and B, but we'll use natural numbers here just to make it a little bit simpler. So anyway, for all natural numbers a and b, there exist integers x and y so that ax plus by is equal to the GCD of a and b, the greatest common divisor of a and b. Often this is said that the greatest common divisor can always be written as a linear combination of the original numbers. Okay, anyway, we're going to start off with a proof of this lemma just to make this video complete. And I really like the proof of this. I think it's a kind of a really nice uh, strategy. Okay, so here's how it goes. So let's consider the following set. And that set is gonna be everything of the form AU plus BV, where U and V are integers, and AU plus BV is strictly bigger than zero. I guess we could leave off that rule that a u plus b v is bigger than zero and just intersect it with the natural numbers, but this is how we'll write it. And so now I'd like to notice the following, and that is that a is most definitely non-empty. So how do we know it's non-empty? Well, observe that we're assuming that a and b are natural numbers, so that means that they're positive already. So we might as well take v to be zero and u to be one. So that means a is an element of a. So, well, that means it's non-empty. Okay, so anyway, we've got a is non-empty and a is a subset of the natural numbers. I think that's also pretty clear too because we're forcing these things to be positive. But now we know by the well ordering principle, I think it's called, that any non-empty subset of the natural numbers has a minimal element. And so let's use that to take the minimum element. And let's call that D. So let's take D equal to the minimum element of A. So it's the smallest element of A. And now within this proof, we're going to make the following claim. And this claim is really all of the hard part of what we're going to do here. And that is that D is a divisor of A. Or very, very similarly, D is a divisor of B. So in other words, D divides A. Or similarly, D divides B. Okay, well, why do I say similarly D divides B? Because the proof that we'll use to show that D divides A is completely parallel to the proof that you would use to show that D divides B. And by that, I mean you just replace A with B. Okay, so this is gonna use something called the division algorithm, which we'll just take for granted, but you can prove that as well using kind of a similar strategy. Okay, so here's what we'll do. We'll write A as D times Q plus R, where R is between zero and D. So in other words, R is the remainder after dividing A by D. So you can always divide one natural number by another natural number, or maybe another non-zero or non-negative integer, and you'll get a quotient and a remainder. And while the remainder, cannot be larger than the thing that you're dividing by. That kind of makes sense. So if you're dividing something by seven, the only reasonable remainders are zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. And while this is just kind of a generalization of that statement. Okay, nice. <clears throat> so now let's see how we can uh, continue this. Well, I'm gonna go up just one step higher 
And notice that we have D is the minimum of A, which means that D is inside of A. But since D is inside of A, that means we can write it as AU plus BV for certain values of U and V. So I'll just take those values to be X and Y. So I'll put here with D equals AX plus BY. So X and Y are the things that achieve that value of D. Okay, so now what we want to do is somehow combine these two equations that we've built. This D equals AX plus BY and this D equals, uh, or this A equals DQ plus R. And we're going to do that by plugging the D equals AX plus BY into this one right here. So observe that gives us A equals AX plus BY all times Q plus R. So I've just replaced D with its expression over there. And now I'm going to move some things around to solve for R. So notice that R can be written as, let's see, it's going to be 1 minus X times Q times A. And then it'll be plus, let's see, that's going to be minus Q times Y times B. But the important thing here is it's a combination of A and B that would lead to being inside of A. But it may not be inside of A. And the only way for it to not to be inside of A would be for it to be equal to zero because notice that R is always non-negative. So that really gives us two cases here. We either have R is equal to zero or R is an element of A. Because if R is bigger than zero, then it satisfies the rules to be inside of A. But now notice that R is always less than D. So this case where R is inside of A means that R is less than D, which is equal to the minimum of A. But that's impossible. You can't have anything inside of a set that's strictly smaller than the minimum element of that set. So that means, in fact, we have R is equal to zero. But now plugging that in up here, that tells us that A is equal to D times Q. In other words, D divides A. And like I said, similarly, we have that D divides B. Okay. So now let's see how this can take us to showing that D is in fact equal to the GCD. Now before we continue on this proof, if you're enjoying the video, make sure to hit the thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed yet, consider doing that. It really helps us out. Okay, so we just showed that D was a divisor of A and B. In other words, it's a common divisor of A and B. Now we want to show that it's the greatest common divisor of A and B. And we do that by taking another common divisor and showing that that other common divisor must divide D. Okay, so let's do that. So here's the little proof of this second claim. So let's suppose that C divides A and C divides B. So in other words, C is another common divisor. But observe, that means that we can write A as C times M and we can write B as C times N for some natural numbers m and n. But now what we'll do is simply plug those expressions for a and b into our equation up there of d equals ax plus by. So let's see, we have d equals, I'm going to write it all out, ax plus by, which is now equal to c times m times x plus c times n times y. But factoring the c out, we have that is equal to, let's see, C times MX plus NY. But now this equation starting over here with D and ending over here with C times all of this stuff implies that C divides D, which nominally tells us that C is less than or equal to D. But if we've got a common divisor, that must be less than or equal to this D right here. That means that our D is in fact the greatest such common divisor. In other words, the GCD. 
Okay, so now let's see how we can use this Bezu's lemma to in fact prove that root two is irrational. Now, before we jump into our last proof, I'd like to tell you about my second channel, Math Major, which includes lecture videos for a ton of upper division math classes, as well as some advanced content all ad free thanks to my Patreon supporters. If you'd like to help me keep that channel ad free, maybe consider joining either the channel memberships here or Patreon. Okay, so now let's jump into our final proof here that the square root of two is irrational. We're using Bezu's lemma over here. So we're gonna start off with a fairly standard step and that is to do this by way of contradiction. So by way of contradiction, let's suppose that the square root of two equals a over b. In other words, we're supposing that it is rational. And we might as well take a and b, or a over b, that fraction to be in lowest terms. But that's in lowest terms exactly when the GCD of a and b is equal to one. But now, once we're talking about the GCD, that means we should probably use Bezu's lemma. So let's do that. So now let's find x and y, which are integers, such that ax plus by equals the GCD of a and b. In this case, that is equal to one. Now, let's see how we can weave these two things together. So now let's notice the following. We have b times the square root of two is equal to a. I think that's pretty clear. But observe, that tells us the following, that a minus b times the square root of two equals zero. Now, it may not seem like we're going down any interesting path here, but what we wanna do is somehow get an ax plus by into this situation. And we're gonna do that by multiplying both sides of this equation by something carefully chosen. And so now we'll do that multiplication. So we've got a minus b root two times y minus x root two is equal to zero times y minus x root two, but zero times anything is kind of obviously equal to zero. So we've got something like that going on. But now what I'd like to do is multiply that out and collect the terms. And what I mean by collect the terms is collect everything which is just an integer. Notice a, b, x, and y are integers. And everything that is an integer multiple of the square root of two. Now, if you wanna get super fancy here, we could say that this equation is living inside of a ring which is z adjoin the square root of two, if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Okay, so anyway, let's multiply this out. So we'll have a times y, and then we'll have this negative b root two times negative x root two, but that's gonna give us a positive two times b times x. Okay, and then we'll have the cross terms. So let's see, that's gonna be, well, I'm gonna write it as minus. So that's gonna be minus the square root of two because both of those are connected to the square root of two. And then we have a times x plus b times y. And then we know all of this is equal to zero. Okay, cool. So we've got all of that worked out. But as you might see, we have built an ax plus by into this equation. But x and y were chosen so that ax plus by was equal to one. So we've got ax plus by, we've got a one right there. So that's just a square root of two. Now what we can do is essentially solve this equation for the square root of two. So we have the square root of two is equal to a y plus two times b times x. But that's a combination of integers. But a combination of integers is always going to be an integer, kind of clearly. Okay, so now where are we gonna go from there? We see that we have not only proven that the square root of two is rational, but we've proven that if it is rational, it's an integer. Now that should probably scream that something wrong is happening here. And you could probably just say that uh, we clearly have a contradiction, but I think it's nice to push it one more step to see this kind of cute contradiction that I like. So let's also note the following. And I think we can all agree that two is bigger than one and less than four. Okay, but now we can take the square root of both parts of this or all three parts of this. 
and get one is less than the square root of two, which is less than four. And that's because the square root is an increasing function. I guess we're not proving that. But now observe, that means that the square root of two, sorry, that should have been a two there, but that tells us that the square root of two in, is inside of the open interval from one to two. Okay, but now let's put these two things together. And by these two things, I mean this line right here and then this next line right here talking about some sets that the square root of two is a part of. So that tells us that the square root of two is inside of the integers intersected with this open interval from one to two. In other words, the square root of two is an integer between one and two. Of course, there are no integers between one and two. In other words, this set is empty. So we just showed that the square root of two was an element of the empty set, but of course the empty set has no elements. So that gives us our contradiction. And just to really finish everything off, what did we contradict? Well, we want to like go upstream in our proof until we made some sort of assumption that didn't follow from any previous step. And that's right at the beginning here, where we, by way of contradiction, suppose that root two was rational. And so since that led us to a contradiction, that means in fact the root two is irrational, which is exactly what we wanted to show.